22 kilometers as the crow flies from the administrative offices of Primorsky Krai, a female leopard on a frosty moonlit night willingly accepts the courting of a handsome male. She has hunted with him, has shared her last piece of meat with him. Three months later, however, as he makes the rounds of his expansive home range, this suitor ganders into a familiar gully only to be thunderstruck by the greeting that he receives. Obviously confused, he can't understand what might be the reason for his girlfriend's radical change in behavior. Nothing is left of their former romance. There is little doubt that he's being shown the door. Such is his lady's rage that our suitor prefers to meekly make an exit rather than risk his health. And the reason this male is exiled from the female's range is this. A new member of this proud troop of Far Eastern Leopards has made an appearance on the scene. For the most endangered yet bravest troop of leopards on Earth has thrown yet another challenge, not just to the power of nature, but to the human race as well. Remarkable hearing. The capacity to see not only in daylight, but also in total darkness. Paws that step through the forest softly, without a sound, but ready in an instance to launch a muscled body into a six meter leap. The skill to patiently creep up on cautious prey at lethally close quarters, or to wait for hours in ambush on a trail as the victim moves in closer and closer, only to receive a powerful blow from a paw with dagger sharp claws. There is no more professional or successful hunter on the planet. Among the meat eaters of the planet, the leopard is undoubtedly the most refined of nature's creations, even though he was created for a life in a warm climate. The leopard has flourished in Africa and in India, but only the Far Eastern subspecies has found a way to survive in a new, unfamiliar land, which is bound in bitter cold half of the year, where half the animals find hideaways to sleep away the winter. You can't say our leopard is fond of snow. The white stuff brings him no joy. But he has learned to live and to hunt in this frozen, snow-covered land. Winter survival in the taiga has left its mark, and not only on the animal's appearance, having rewarded him with long fur and a luxuriant, fluffy tail. There have also been changes in behavior. As his southern colleagues raise hell in India, fearlessly entering villages in search of prey, and even eating humans. The Far Eastern Leopard has taken a quiet and peaceful leave of absence from humans. The original natives, armed with bows and arrows, gave him no trouble. But Russian immigrants disrupted this historical peace agreement, as shots rang out in the Ussuriski Taiga. At first, the leopard was simply a rare and prestigious trophy for well-to-do hunters. Then the leopard became an obstacle to economic development and had to be destroyed. The first count of leopards was made in 1972, and the results were shocking. Using tracks in the snow to determine numbers, biologists Vladimir Abramov, Dmitry Pikonov, and Vyacheslav Bazilnikov determined that there were fewer than 40 animals left in the wild, and that these animals were hiding in the mountains, in the black fir and Korean pine forests of southwest Primorsky Krai an area visible from Vladivostok across Amurski Bay. And today, just as 30 years ago, people wait for good snow to head out into the field. In an age of mind-blowing digital technologies and space travel, a new generation of biologists, tracking not in the traditions of Fenimore Cooper, but according to Formozov, Ashmar, and Ipikunov, takes off along trails, up hills and into valleys, logging dozens of kilometers a day in the steps of their predecessors. This generation, like earlier ones, can read at a glance and without skipping a line the detailed book of animal stories that are printed in the snow. And as earlier, along with a break for lunch, 
tired but refreshed by a steaming cup of tea at a campfire, and at times having to spend the night under a spruce tree, the tracking goes on. And as earlier, their primary tools are a belief in oneself, a sharp eye, and an old-fashioned tape measure. Each of these individuals can instantly differentiate a leopard track from a tiger, or a lynx track. Although to get an explanation from them about the differences, in theory, well, they'll just shrug their shoulders. Each can accurately determine the freshness of a track by indicators specific to an animal. Each knows the size of a male's paw, the size of a female's paw, for each leopard has its own personality. Then, having returned from the field to warm winter apartments, these same personalities gather together for a large academic round table. And to the point of growing hoarse, they argue endlessly, each defending a personal opinion. And what comes from this discussion is an official truth, something called the latest results of a leopard survey. And each and every time, the final figure turns out to be painfully familiar, no more than 30 to 40 leopards. An alternative to snow surveys appeared on the scene about five years ago, a survey method that uses camera traps. Each leopard's coat has a totally unique pattern. A camera trap and a computer are totally dispassionate. Romance is left at the door and personalities play no role. But even so, the camera trap method gives the same result, 30 to 40. The latest official figures from the most recent surveys set the total number at 37 individuals. Our young fellow wasn't included in the count, either as tracks or a photo, for he was still in his cave. He has become number 38. Come spring, a female with kittens enters a season of plenty. Badgers move out of their winter burrows. Instead of an agonizing chase after a quick hooved deer, our leopard can patiently wait on its prey under cover, sitting somewhere along the badger's trail. But in the land of the leopard, the warmth of spring brings fire. Fire arrived a hundred years ago with the first immigrants. Fire arrived as part of a Western Russian agricultural tradition and it has been used as a weapon in the struggle with an alien and frighteningly dark taiga. And so for a hundred years, each spring and autumn, the land of the leopard is blanketed in the smoke of fires. Frightening, senseless, and merciless. Like an evil genie released from a bottle, these annual fires turn grasslands into uncontrollable fires. And the only way to save yourself from a fire is to start a backfire. Small plot holders start fires to save themselves from farmers, and farmers start fires to save themselves from small plot holders, while the railroad sets fires for all. The catch-22 is that you're not going to bust anyone for setting a fire, and besides, there's no one out there to catch them. The Far Eastern Leopard really wasn't created to live a life on mountain ridges and inaccessible cliffs. Just like his southern cousins, there was a time when he felt grand in the steppeland plains, having settled in the lands around Lake Honka. These inescapable, infernal annual fires drove the leopard from the plains, pitilessly and unrelentingly pushing them further and further into the mountains. An adult Far Eastern leopard has few natural enemies. Thanks to locally snowy winters, those cursed enemies of his southern cousin, the lions and the hyenas, were left behind in the hot countries of the south. The Himalayan black bear poses no threat, especially since the bear is mostly a vegetarian. And a brown bear is unlikely to chase down and catch a wily leopard. All the more so that bears hibernate in winter, abandoning the taiga until spring. So winter, in the land of the leopard, is the kingdom of the cat, though it's hardly a peaceful kingdom. The Far Eastern Cat is ten times smaller than a leopard, though he's not averse to stealing and hiding a chunk of a leopard's kill. The lynx is significantly larger than a forest cat. He's also not one to refuse a bite from the leopard's table, and he'll also munch down a forest cat as a meal. But both the forest cat and the lynx 
when confronted by a leopard, share a common reaction, a panic escape. For the leopard is not shamed by catching and eating his much smaller forest relatives. But there's still one other cat around, the Amur tiger. Tigers in the land of the leopard were a rarity until recently. Tigers were known to pass through Kidrovia Pod Zapavidnik a couple of times each winter. But these days, tigers are tracked here regularly, sometimes in pairs, and they're not shy about visiting the central portion of the Zapavidnik. Naturally, in such instances, the leopard has to be careful. The tiger will instantly snatch the leopard's kill, forcing him to head out again and again to hunt a meal. Any attempt to defend his property would end sadly for the leopard. It is said that the tiger is unable to climb trees, but where there is a need, there is a will. In 2002, a leopard corpse was discovered that had clearly not died from natural causes. Tracks in the snow showed that he fought his foe to the bitter end, for his claws retained the fur of his killer. Bites to the skull and the evidence left in those claws left no doubts a tiger had killed the leopard. The conflict with their striped brothers has forced leopards into a compromising situation. They give up the bottomlands where tigers most frequently travel and take to those inaccessible cliffs. Things are a lot worse with the other neighbor. The camera traps have identified only seven leopards living in the region's protected areas. The 30 other leopard portraits have been obtained from areas where people hunt. Here in southwest Primorsky Krai, people are used to hunting using organized drives. One group of hunters carefully and quietly takes up a spot and hides along a boundary of the hunt zone. And their comrades, starting at the other end, take up sticks and buckets and noisily bang the surrounding wildlife toward the firing line. So after such a cleanup, the leopard is out of luck in trying to find prey. And if he's not careful, he could find himself in the midst of the drive. And just like the deer, he's left but with one way out, and that is to head towards the firing line. And this means entrusting one's faith to such waning qualities as a hunter's honor and decency. And so the leopard, each hunting season, must tempt fate in a real game of Russian roulette. But again he has issued a challenge. He has not given up. He has not abandoned his range and lands that have been given over to the hunting world. And he has learned to survive in these conditions. There is even one case when a lone female leopard spent several years professionally working the fringes of these drives, picking up the wounded as the hunters whooped it up following their hunt. But what is really frightening for the leopard is the lone poor hunter from local villages. The fellow who dips into the taiga without any witnesses, who isn't at all burdened by either sport hunting traditions, or the honor of a club, or the bounds of a fixed hunting area, or the seasons for the hunt. It is 1996. 
The project is underway to track radio collared leopards. One of the females captured by scientists has a paw that has been seriously injured by a poacher's snare, and severe infections are threatening its life. The female undergoes an operation in the field. While she is recovering, the patient is placed in an enclosure and is carefully attended to. The paw is slowly recovering, but it will be risky to release this animal back into the wild. So the only practical future for Lucy, for that's what she's been named, is to put her in the Moscow Zoo. Only Lucy didn't make the trip to the zoo. Shooting the leopard right there in her cage, the senseless poacher hoped to escape with the trophy over his shoulder but he was caught in the act by a field inspector. It's 2007. An anti-poaching team gets an anonymous call about a dead leopard. State Inspector Yevgeny Toma is assigned to the search that is underway by Rosselhoznadzor and by officers of the Hasansky Police Department. On the second day, the body of the spotted cat is discovered three kilometers from the village of Bamburova on the grounds of the Barsawi Refuge. The autopsy reveals that it was shot as it fled. The bullet shattered its pelvic bone and landed in the abdominal cavity. The animal sat back on its haunches and was killed by blows to the head from a heavy object. The victim was a young female who had yet to deliver a kitten. This leopard, the older brother of the female mentioned above, was lucky. He managed to gain himself a hunting territory near a deer farm. Several hundred spotted deer are held in captivity so that annually the male's freshly grown antlers can be clipped. Antler velvet is used widely in Chinese medicine and truly has miraculous qualities in boosting a man's libido. There was a time, during socialism, when the government held a strict monopoly on trade with foreigners. It was an era when antler velvet was worth twice that of gold. Deer farms flourished, the number of deer increased, and soon their number exceeded the grazing capacity of those enclosed compounds. But today, the price for antler velvet doesn't even cover the cost of raising the deer, which is not to say that Chinese men have lost any concern about their manhood. What happened is that with the collapse of socialism, the monopoly also collapsed. And with the disappearance of a monopoly, the artificial pricing policy vanished. And with that, the Chinese immediately dropped the price paid for the Russian antler velvet. And today, the deer farms are on a road to disaster, operations that are but a pitiful reflection of their past. But economic paradoxes are of no interest to the leopard. What has his attention is a working supermarket that is open winter and summer and day and night without any weekends or holidays, a place where there is an inexhaustible supply of warm, healthy meat. Drop by, take a look, and have a bite. That's why leopards love a deer farm, and that's why they are aggressive in establishing home ranges nearby. That's why deer farmers hate leopards, and that's why they wage a fierce war with what they consider a predator. For the leopard is throwing a challenge to the human concept of private property. As deer farms collapse, locals are shifting to raising goats and sheep. And the leopard has again entered into a conflict with humans. How can one resist preying on such a lethargic and carefree beast? Judge for yourself. Can one really resist such a temptation? This meal is full and forever doomed, for a Damocles sword of human revenge forever hangs over him for stealing animals.
If only these were the extent of the leopard's misfortune. Now there is something new, an unnoticed misfortune, an imperceptible misfortune, the misfortune of inbreeding, something that occurs when small population groups occupy limited areas. The seriousness of the threat can only be determined by giving a medical examination to some portion of the leopards. And here's where an international research team heads out into the taiga. They are not your just regular out for a stroll forest types. These are doctors, but not just any doctors. For this is indeed a rare bunch. You try to land a needle in the vein of a leopard using a headlamp in the middle of the night. An ordinary doctor doesn't haul loads of critical medical gear up a mountain. He'll wait for the patient to show up in an office for a checkup. An ordinary doctor doesn't have the skills to track a patient up a gully or to chase him down a trail. An ordinary doctor isn't going to trap a live 60 kilogram animal, one built of fine-tuned muscles, one with sharp teeth and razor claws. No ordinary doctor is likely to know how to trap this animal in a way that he doesn't risk his own safety or endanger the predator. And no ordinary doctor rushes to get things done or hurries to undertake 10 complex activities, all the while keeping an eye on the animal's condition since the action of the immobilizing drug lasts only a certain amount of time. The first leopard inspected confirms the worst of the concerns. There are murmurs found in the heart, and the exam shows that this male hardly has what it takes to ensure a future generation. True, he isn't that young, and is probably more than 10 years old. The ailments discovered could simply be signs of old age, and not the troubling signs related to inbreeding. At first glance, the second patient lends the doctors some optimism. This is a rare, strong, healthy, well-fed cat, one at the height of its prowesses. And this guy's body parts, the ones needed to keep things going, are in good shape. These first medical exams result in more questions than answers for our doctors. So that means more captures. Field science moves slowly, and the number of those who are moving it forward can be counted on a single hand. And tomorrow could hand the leopards nothing but trouble. The tigers killed by a commercial bus on the road from Habaras to Vladivostok was not just some chance victim. Her death marked the start of a new era in the relationship between wild nature and the internal combustion engine. The urban businessman, exhausted from the routine of urban life, has taken the term off-road entirely too literally. Japanese vehicles are no longer a luxury and are the way to get to places where few people would ever go on foot. and the capacity to get out into the wild is magnified by the miracles worked at tune-up and service centers for these Japanese vehicles. Places that recently had no foot traffic are today places where the roar of jeeps can be heard. These extremely remote and out-of-the-way landscapes, where for generations females gave birth and raised kittens, are today the places where the off-road extremists have their way and where ripped up landscapes are left behind. But this is a fine weather event compared to the near future. What Russian doesn't like a fast ride? And what resident of Primorsky Krai hasn't been jarred by the potholes of the Hasansky Highway? The unquenchable thirst for speed and the dream of a personal role in geopolitics has given birth to a mega project, a plan to build a superhighway where cars can race in excess of 100 kilometers an hour. When this highway opens, Chinese goods moving from customs houses on the border, will travel to exclusive French boutiques in Vladivostok in a flash. The cost to people will be enormous. The cost of this last handful of 40 leopards may be unbearable. 
The right of way will create a half kilometer of open, impassable space. A no man's land that leopards, and roe deer and spotted deer also, have used to get to the sea. With a highway, the path to the sea will be cut off and lost forever. This is but a tip of an iceberg of mega projects planned to stimulate regional economic development. Our young male will spend a year and a half with his mother. Then she'll drive her young one from her hunting territory, having bestowed upon him all the tools of the trade. He'll have to find himself a hunting ground. But this creates a problem, for all the gullies have already been divided up among the elders. The young male, in his wanderings, inevitably comes face to face with strong, mighty hunters. Here the boss is a 10-year-old, a leopard at the top of his form. He doesn't as much as wink at the uninvited guest, so self-assured is he in his strengths and rights. Each of the young male's movements show signs of uncertainty. He moves as if walking on flaming embers. Even so, he heads towards a meeting with fate. Soon our boss loses patience and he quickly lets it be known that he's invited no intruders. The young male gives way, wanting no fight, for he is too inexperienced to get into a rumble. Although he already exhibits signs of an unbending stubbornness, a trait essential to his future survival. Our youth attempts, again and again, to demonstrate a right to another cat's prey. But the boss is steadfast, He's not about to allow anyone else into his dining hall. And if his demonstration of strength fails to impress, there will be a fight to the death. The guest doesn't take to fighting. He is clearly at a disadvantage. And though he attempts to show his independence and indifference, still he moves on. His travels will take him to another pass and to a next meeting with a powerful male. Securing a hunting territory is a tough task anywhere on the planet. For a young Far Eastern leopard, securing a hunting territory is an, an almost impossible task. For the humans have left no open places, no open spaces, on this very narrow strip of land we call the land of the leopard. We remain incorrigible. The tough times of the past are being replaced by the tough times of the present. Something else always seems to take precedent. Each and every time we leave wisdom to the future. But all we are doing is fooling ourselves. We fooled ourselves, believing that sometime soon a comfortable rocket will carry us off to some new blossoming planet, meaning that here on old man earth, we can live out our times as best we can. We fooled ourselves, believing that the sensation of creating Dolly the sheep in a test tube 
will let us shift the responsibility for the mistakes made in haste today to the shoulders of future generations, future generations that we will believe will be wiser and richer, generations that will diligently recreate all that we have destroyed. But this is all a falsehood. Our grandchildren won't be able to turn history around, nor will they be able to make fair all our blunders. For if they indeed do turn out to be wiser, that wisdom will include embarrassment for the irresponsible ways of their ancestors. <laughs>